Hey, look what my wife gave me this year for Christmas. This is Ellen White, Plagiarism, and the Real Reasons People Leave the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Take One. And hello, I'm Les Miller. Just get my monitor back up here. There we go. Coming to you with another webcam video, giving us a try. Uh, this is my first live recorded video since my kitty cat Oreo died. And I would just like to ask for your prayers as an audience. I just need some encouragement. That's what I need. So I, that's what I ask you to pray for. So as I said at the title there, Ellen White Plagiarism, The Real Reasons People Leave, The Seventh-day Adventist Church. Just got to get my notes in a better position here. Uh, this is hopefully the last in my series, Answering Critics of Adventism. You might want to know why I've never made a video actually showing Ellen White from the positive side. That's something I remember one person said in one of the comments was she didn't like Adventism because of all the ways we tried to defend Ellen White and it turned her off. Well, for me, I simply don't think I can do the topic justice because it's just so big a topic. And there's lots of videos out there by our big name speakers, Doug Batchelor, Mark Finley. I'll let them handle all those kinds of things. I'd like to just make videos that maybe other Adventists won't be making that maybe also need to be watched with things that need to be said in them. So that's why. I have said it before, I think, but if not, I'll say it now. Three things brought me into the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The practical Christian love that I saw from my wife, the Bible studies I did with her pastor, and by then I had read the Bible all the way through, and I could poke holes in evangelical theology, especially that of Pentecostalism. But I'd also been reading Renee Neuerbergen's Ellen White, Prophet of Destiny. And this is why I think the topic of covering Ellen White is so big. Chapter one of that book, he goes through 10 tests of a prophet while ignoring the other supernatural manifestations, just tests like her character, the results of her work, the predictions, etc., etc. And then he spends the rest of the book showing how Ellen White passed all those tests. I can't fit all that into a 30-minute video, but I will say this. Ellen White's as far as me, as far as my journey into Adventism, Ellen White's contribution was icing on the cake. Had I had no interest or openness to Ellen White, had I never read that book, after my Bible study sessions, after my wife's example of kindness, I still would have become a Seventh-day Adventist. And eventually I would have accepted, yes, that this is a true prophet. I think one of the reasons a lot of people that do criticize us um, do so is because um, probably they come from Calvinism, probably come from once saved, always saved. You know, um, I, I, apparently also, I, I've heard that there's a lot of anti-Ellen White criticism among the Muslim community, because when you think about it, if God had called Muhammad and supposedly he's the last prophet, then why would he call Ellen White? And if he called Ellen White and she's the last prophet, then Muhammad definitely is not God's prophet because the Quran does not agree with the Bible. I'm going to give you again, let's get my book out here, Judd Lake's book, Ellen White Under Fire, another one of those answering criticisms, page 341 the actual number of pages of sayings that the critics challenge is 0.1% of her writings. I'm, I want you to think about that. Okay, 0.1%. You total up all the stuff that's out there. Oh, I'm not an Adventist because of this, 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 and this. It's 0.1%. There's 99.9% .9 proof. Ellen White's a true prophet. If you want to receive it, you can. But where did all this come from? Well, let's go to his book again and 
We're on page 57. He, this is a chapter called Dudley M. Canwright, Father of Ellen White Criticism. Canwright was a uh, Adventist pastor who left the church here. This is what uh, Judd Lake says about him. When Canwright left the Seventh-day Adventist church in early 1887, the church was on the threshold of a major theological change. The law-centered theology of the General Conference leadership, headed by G.I. Butler and Uriah Smith, was about to clash with the Christ-centered theology of E.J. Wagner and A.T. Jones at the 1888 Minneapolis General Conference session. So we were going through our own crisis of faith as a group, as a whole, at the time. This man left before the solution came to the crisis. And he left basically with his opinions being set by the situation as it was when he left. Page 58 here. But D.M. Canwright wasn't around to hear the message of 1888 or to experience the ensuing revival. He was outside of the church, engaged in a campaign against it. During his 32-year-long campaign against Adventism, he either failed to recognize or refused to acknowledge the positive impact of the 1888 message on the church. And pages 60 and 61. Most of the criticisms circulating on the internet today are recycled from Canwright's complaints. Even when an occasional new criticism is posted, it still stands in the framework of his stratagem. So there you go. The 0.1% was already beginning in the lifetime of Ellen White. If you uh, did see my response video to the critics, I talked about that lady in Canmore when we were planting the Canmore church. And I remember the anti-Ellen White pamphlet she gave me after she said she wasn't coming back. They referred to a statement Ellen White makes about how the angels that go back and forth from the city to the earth, they have a little golden card and there's an angel at the gate that checks the golden card as they're leaving and coming back. Angels have ID badges. Angels have driver's licenses, right? Healthcare cards, whatever you want to call it. And then they go with Revelation 22, 19 in this pamphlet that anybody adds to the message of the Bible, therefore, they're a false prophet. Okay, well, can you not see how nitpicky that is? Can you not see how silly that's being? Remember, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets, right? So what does that mean? It means new truth can be pro proclaimed by a new prophet as long as the new truth doesn't conflict with the old truth. Joseph Smith, Mary Baker Eddy, they conflict with the Bible, but Ellen White's stuff doesn't conflict. So this is just an optional extra, little, little tidbit, extra thing. If you want to believe it, believe it. If you don't want to believe it, don't believe it. Who cares? Why does it matter? There's really only three reasons why people leave the Seventh-day Adventist Church. One is, as I said in my video, help for ex-Adventists. Quoting Pastor Randy Barber, it's a control issue, and they're unwilling to die to themselves. Basically, they're just whining. They didn't get their own way, so they left. That may sound harsh, but I was like that in 2005. I had some disagreements with my local church over how to do evangelism. And I was so staunch in what I was trying to get, I seriously considered leaving because I thought they were all in apostasy. Finally, someone said to me, word for word, it's like you think you're the savior of the Airdrie Church. And those words hit me so hard. And I realized she was right and I was wrong. If you're willing to die to yourself, you'll make it through and you'll be able to understand that the people aren't perfect, but the message is. And that's the next reason people leave the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I've heard this. Someone doesn't turn the other cheek well enough. Someone doesn't do any of these practical love aspects of the Bible well enough, like my wife did with me, very good. And all of a sudden that person's like, well, that's not very Adventist of you. And I heard that word for word once from a lady. 
In other words, they think because they've been shown a perfect message that the people are perfect also. There's a big difference between the people and the message. And then the other reason people leave the Seventh-day Adventist Church has to do with D.M. Canwright. I read Ellen White's response letter to him when he left. I didn't read all of Canwright's official declaration he was leaving, but I read enough to see what was going on. And this is my opinion as an individual Adventist. You can disagree if you want. Quote Canwright if you want in the, in the comments. Correct me if you want, but the impression I have, it, he, he went through a crisis of faith himself and he just didn't pass the test. Because you see, when you really come down to it, when you really understand what Adventism is all about, the calling that's set before us is higher than we as human beings are capable of living up to. To me, that's proof that it is the truth. Remember Romans 3.23, right? All have sinned and what? They've come short of the glory of God. So if the glory of God is above us, and if he's trying to draw us to himself, work on perfecting us, sanctifying us, getting us ready for heaven in a place where we will be perfect through him, then why would he give us a message that we're capable of living up to? Remember the book of Jude. We look unto Jesus. He's the author and finisher of our faith. And he promised elsewhere in the Bible what he started in us, he will keep working on. We just have to keep coming back to him. And that's what the church as a whole, as I said, was going through in 1888. Canwright failed the test. He just didn't pass. And if you want to go and look up a whole bunch of anti ellen White criticism right now, type in, ex-Adventist, former Adventist, defeating Adventism. These are the kinds of people you'll find. One, two, three. Whiners, looking to the people, not enough faith to see the difference, and their own personal experience. They decided to find a theology that they could live up to. And that's basically all it is. But let's deal with this issue of plagiarism. I remember 2006, my very first time going on YouTube. One of the first videos I ever watched was a funny video. It took a scene from Monty Python and the Holy Grail, and it superimposed some of the audio from a Star Wars movie. So you've got a character in the story speaking what's in the story, then all of a sudden the response is Darth Vader's voice instead. And I thought it was hilarious. You go to a concert, a rock concert in the 1970s, you would see right on the ticket, no cameras, no recording devices of any kind because they were worried about piracy. They didn't want anybody stealing their music. Today, what happens? Anytime a public figure is speaking, right? What's he speaking to or she speaking to? A sea of cell phones. People are holding up their cameras, recording every minute. They're watching it on a two-inch screen rather than watching it in person. Our view of what constitutes copyright has changed in our culture. And people can take the work of others and mash it up into their own work. And it's considered their own work in a way. And this is what happened with Ellen White. And she herself admitted to it in the introduction to the great controversy. So they had the same kind of ideas about plagiarism back then that we have now that have just evolved in this generation. And when all these plagiarism uh, criticisms were made, like that book, The White Lie, I think that was 1980, I'm not sure. I wasn't in the church then. But that other culture of, I get to have my own stuff as me only, nobody gets to steal it. That was the mentality at the time. But whether or not she quoted somebody else, think about what's being said and see the value of the theology. It fits into the 99.9%. This is a challenge I'm going to lay out to you. If you are honestly staunch on this plagiarism idea, I want to you to consider Jesus was not the first to quote and say the golden rule. So Jesus plagiarized. So you have to call Jesus a false prophet. Remember Paul, Acts 17. What did he say to the Greeks on Mars Hill? As also some of your own poets have said. In other words, he's loosely referring to, where's the footnote? Which poet is he quoting? Paul plagiarized when he said, we are also his offspring. 
you have to call Paul a false prophet. And I think one of the reasons why people reject Ellen White, and especially if they dwell on the plagiarism thing, they don't really understand how God inspires a prophet. Numbers, chapter 12, verse 6. This is God speaking. Then he said, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision, and I speak to him in a dream. What happens when God inspires a prophet? He puts a message in that person's head. It's basically like virtual reality. It's like a living experience in their mind. But then he leaves the person to choose the words that describe the experience. The inspiration is the experience only. The words are written. Unless in the Bible it says, thus says the Lord, the person holding the pen is choosing the words. It's just they're based on what the experience was. But God, of course, guides the person to choose the right words. So if the person chooses someone else's words and those words accurately describe the vision, that's okay. It's not a big deal. But if you believe that the Bible was word for word for word, exactly, every single thing written down was exactly that God told Moses, you shall say this, 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 and this in Genesis chapter 1. You shall say this, this, and this in chapter 2. That's how Muslims believe the Quran was inspired. So then you're going to call anybody else a false prophet. Well, it's an incorrect theology, and that's the problem. I've got another book here, which also comments on the same kind of thing. The Prophet and Her Critics by Leonard Brand and Don S. McMahon. A striking new analysis refutes the charges that Ellen White borrowed the health message. Specifically talking about the health message, but talks really about anything else. Seven. Page 87 first. As Christians, as Adventists, we should also refrain from attempting to control the decisions others make. So we shouldn't object to people holding opinions different from our own on those issues of the nature of inspiration. However, when people challenge the divine inspiration and reliability of either the Bible or the writings of Ellen White, then we have a right to expect that they have based their challenges on a high-quality examination of the evidence with the very best approach to research design. When instead the challengers have based their research on a very inadequate research design and faulty logic, such as we find in the publications of Ray, Butler, and Numbers, people who dwell on the plagiarism thing, then we have a right to be skeptical of their conclusions. Their claims that her writings can be explained as originating from strictly human sources do not stand up to critical evaluation. Dr. Don McMahon's research reveals a dramatic difference in quality between Mrs. White's health principles and those advocated by other health reformers in the 1800s. The point of the book is that basically Ellen White wasn't the only person talking about health reform in the 1800s. There were lots of people, but those people, they had some truth, but they also had some sort of weird, kooky thing that there's no way could be true mixed in with it. How could Ellen White have sorted out the good from the bad if she had no one guiding her? The critics today of Ellen White admit, just like those who believe she's a prophet, that she had no education beyond grade three, that she, she had no way she could have known these things. So people who don't believe say she stole them from other people. Then she would have stolen something that was stupid and doesn't work. This is page 88. So, so the evidence presented in this book indicates that God gave us the health principles contained in the writings of Ellen White. Why did he bother to give them to us? And why should we take the trouble to live by them? We don't earn salvation points by living healthy lives, but we do give glory to God by becoming living demonstrations of the benefits of trusting him and following his advice. 
Ellen White wrote much about preparation for the return of Jesus to this earth. If God inspired her health writings, does it seem likely that he would leave her to randomly copy false material in other subjects important to our salvation and our relationship to him? The relationship between doctrine and faith is illustrated in those words, and it's something that, you know, sometimes we make mistakes in how we present some of the things we believe in. Think about Proverbs 20, right? Wine is a mocker, strong drink arouses brawling. So if you come into Adventism with the attitude of, I'm not allowed to drink booze anymore, that's legalism. But if it's Jesus saved me from alcohol, that's faith. But if you say, well, New Testament wipes out that verse, I can drink or not drink, I don't care, then that is, as some people call it, greasy grace, as I like to call it, just false theology. And it's the same with everything. Paul kept the Sabbath, Acts chapter 13. We're going to read 42 to 44. And when Jesus went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them next Sunday. No, next Sabbath. And when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in their own strength, being legalists? No, in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. Remember Luke chapter 4, verse 16. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. So Sabbath keeping can only be done by a true faith experience in him. But how is it legalism to follow their example and keep it the way the Bible says we're supposed to? Sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. The point I'm trying to make at the end here, and we can talk about the truth about death, how Daniel and Paul were both promised not that they would go to heaven immediately, but they would rise at the end. In other words, the second coming. Uh, any other topic. What I'm talking about here in this relationship between doctrine and faith as I end this. If you are really questioning anything that's challenging to Ellen, uh, to Ellen White, presented to you by any of these anti-Adventist people, it's part of that 0.1%. The way to know for sure is to get strong on the 99.99. Read the Bible on, on, and check out the verses on the Sabbath. Check out the verses on the truth about death. I've got video after video after video on all those topics on Les Millman. Yes, they're old videos with old cameras, but the theology is there. Why don't you check out some of Ellen White's writings? Why don't you read Steps to Christ? Why don't you read Desire of Ages? Then come back and tell me she's a false prophet. To help, in the end screen, I'll put a link for the playlist of my musical meme videos. By the grace of God, 18 videos so far. Maybe that'll be it. They're peppered with slides, uh, pictures I've taken, and... Some of those slides have Ellen White quotes. Some of those slides have Bible verses. Some of those slides are just thoughts that came to me. Some of them are quotes from other ministers. But you will see a depth of spirituality there in all of them, including in Ellen White's writings. So that's what I want to ask you to do. Check out her stuff from the source. Don't go to somebody from the outside in who's basically trying to vandalize the Seventh-day Adventist Church. 